Good morning, church. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. This morning's Bible reading is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. I shall now invite Reverend Dr. Tunichi to share God's word with us this morning. Thank you and good morning, church. It's uh, my joy to be here and especially as I speak on behalf of Jenny, uh, it is uh, a great opportunity for us to just take time uh, in these last weeks while we are here in this part of the world uh, before we return to, the, uh, to Australia to just uh, have some time of uh, reunion with some of our friends. First of all, I just want to express uh, our personal thanks to your pastors, uh, Pastor Andrew and Danny, for uh, allowing us to be here and uh, especially giving me this opportunity to uh, share God's word with you. Uh, this is a very special time of uh, our journey between uh, Jenny and myself. Uh, in many ways, it is... Uh, opportunity for us to say thanks to this particular church uh, where we grew up. And uh, some of you may not know this, but uh, uh, I was uh, seated on the third row, the third pew, I remember, right in the middle, when I was a student at uh, Anglo-Chinese school. And there received, right there while I was seated, that's where Kwek Song Tsai is actually seated now, uh, where I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I was converted uh, at a chapel service. Uh, this was a special combined service, and uh, all the school uh, uh, students were there, and we had a guest speaker from uh, some other place. And it was there, on that very seat, that uh, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. It's uh, right here in this altar where I was baptized, uh, it's here in this particular church where uh, I had the call to ministry and when I heard the very distinct voice of God uh, telling me that uh, I should give my life to him and to be a pastor. Uh, it was here in the back stalls that I sang in the choir under the direction of the Chua Cheng Chai. This was the place where my wife and I were married. Uh, this was the place, uh, this church, uh, we were in the youth fellowship, we were in the Sunday school. This was the breeding place for myself to learn ministry and to preach. And uh, I had many opportunities not to preach from this uh, particular pulpit, but uh, was asked to go to different parts of, uh, of Moa and uh, other areas where we would conduct uh, worship services. Uh, it was here that uh, I, for the first time, preached in Malay at our Baba service. And uh, this is the church that we grew from. And uh, wherever I have been in the United States or in uh, Australia, in Singapore and other parts of the world, I've always said that Malacca Wesley is my home church. This is our church. This is the church that uh, we have uh, grown up in and that we are very proud of and uh, where I received uh, a lot of my early understanding of the Christian faith. The church is the place 
where I not only found Christ, but the church, this particular church, is the church that sent me out uh, up, up to this point of our life. And uh, as we return to, the, to uh, Australia, uh, this, this will be our last chapter, as it were, as we commence our ministry there again and uh, start uh, new things in the, the life of the work of the church. So it was uh, like almost uh, like 60 years ago that uh, I was uh, first at the point of uh, receiving Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior in this particular church. And uh, this weekend has been a very special one because it's not only a reunion with uh, friends uh, and uh, with people whom we have uh, grown up with all through these years, but in particular of uh, my classmates who have come from various distances just to be together for our reunion. This is a very special year also of the horse. And uh, we all turned 72 this year. Uh, so you can see that uh, this is a very, very special place for us. Uh, just now, uh, the uh, pastor was asking that uh, we introduce some of our friends, but uh, the, the spouses, the respective spouses, did not stand. So I just want uh, them to be recognized as well. Uh, may I just uh, say, uh, first of all, our thanks to Brother Tony Koo, uh, in fact, I was almost going to say Pastor Tony Koo, but uh, uh, Brother Tony Koo, who sort of coordinated everything for us over this weekend. But uh, we have uh, Mr. and Mrs. Tan Meng Hui. If, uh, if uh, you can please stand again. Uh, just to, Yeah, that's it. We want, you to see, we want you to see them and uh, please remain standing. Uh, Dr. and uh, Mrs. Wong Wai Kwan, if you, uh, Wai Ping, Mr. Mrs. Wong Wai Ping, a uh, quack Swan Sai. Uh, you all understand, uh, Ho Hock Guan, and then we of course have got Wai Xin and her husband uh, Chan Yin. Uh, if you maybe stand as well because uh, you're part of the team that uh, has been here. There are others, others whom we have met uh, who are not here this morning and we will be meeting again this afternoon. But uh, here are my wonderful friends who are here and then of course my wife Jenny, where is she? We ask her to stand as well. Jenny, you please stand. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, warm welcome to my friends. The scripture has been read, and uh, I just want to share with you some thoughts that come from uh, my heart as I share with you the things that uh, have been uh, very much impressed upon me to uh, at least uh, bring it out before you as... Uh, some, some form of uh, encouragement to God's people. Uh, some time ago, I saw uh, from the YouTube an interview that was uh, conducted and uh, that uh, some of the people who were there were asked the question, if you are in life as such that uh, you are thinking about the journey of your life and everything that has happened in your life, what would you uh, do in terms of describing it in a form of uh, I can't, uh, sort of a picture or a drawing? Uh, and there was someone in this YouTube who actually said that uh, one of the things that uh, make life very interesting for him is that Life is like an upside-down you. So it begins from the bottom, and then uh, you try and rise as much as you can. You work as hard as you can. And uh, within about 30 years or 35 years, you reach your peak. And uh, you uh, sort of plateau for a little while, go on a, on a cruise after... 35 and you come to 40 and then after that it's all downhill and uh, and uh, he describes this in the picture form of a uh, upside down U U shape going up and around about 30 35 40 45 that's the when the person peaks 
And when the person achieves all that he wants to do, and from 45 on, it's a sort of a downward spiral until you pass away, as it were. And that was quite a, quite a common way of looking at things. Uh, it's in the upside-down, U-shaped form. But there was one person who responded to it from a Christian viewpoint, and I thought it was very interesting. And instead of looking at life's journey as an upside-down U-shape, that this person said life can be actually seen in terms of a climbing up of staircase. It's a staircase in life, and then there are three steps or stages of this staircase climb. And in the point of fact that uh, today people live longer and uh, better in terms of uh, all the treatment that is uh, given to us, that uh, they can live in three stages. And stage one will be uh, going up, upwards uh, from year one to about year 30. And then from 31 years to about uh, 60 is stage two, climb. And then you got your third stage of life. And the third stage of this upward climb, it's always an upward climb, is from 61 and up. Some people live beyond 90 years old and in a very fruitful way as well. And it's very interesting to look at it, not in terms of a spiral downward after all your achievements, but it's a continuous climb, that life is a continuous challenge, that we progress from one stage of our life to another. And that uh, as we uh, finish two stages, there's always something to look ahead always something beyond where you have been to get to where you want to be in the eyes of God. And so if you look at it carefully, uh, it is a beautiful and wonderful way of understanding what life is all about. It is, in fact, in the Old Testament, very testified for us in Scripture of a time when Moses, you remember, began his ministry where at the age of 80. Uh, he was called to take God's people out of uh, the uh, place of bondage in Egypt and then moving on into the promised land. He started at the last stage of his life in a continuous fashion, going uphill and an upward climb for a very special purpose in God. More interesting, if you read the scripture in the Old Testament, and particularly in Joshua, in the 14th chapter, if you're taking down notes, in the 14th chapter, in the book of Joshua, comes a time when God's people had already traveled over a whole generation across the Sinai Desert and entering into the Promised Land. And of how Joshua and Caleb, just the two who survived from the generation of people who left Egypt, entered the promised land. And of how Caleb said to Joshua, you remember those early years when we followed Moses and when God promised Moses that God will bring his people under the leadership of Moses into the promised land. Moses is now dead. And here we are, just two of us, with a new generation looking towards this upward climb of an opportunity. You know what Caleb said? He was 83 years old. Can you just imagine that? 83 years old. And he said to Joshua, do you remember God's promise? That when we enter this promised land, he will give us a piece of land. He will give us a place so we may dwell. And Caleb in chapter 14 in Joshua, said to Joshua, I want that mountain. I want that place. I want to start new life with my family. And how wonderful it is that he at 83 began a wonderful ministry uh, in the new promised land. In the New Testament, there's not only the teaching of Jesus, that speaks to us about looking at opportunities of ministry and uh, claiming 
his promises. But in St. Paul's letter, we find in Philippians chapter 3, for example, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul speaks about the same thing. He says, I have now achieved this wonderful ministry that God calls me to do. He goes about and he sets up one church after another. And he says, I press on. Think about that, friends. I press on toward the goal of the high calling. It's always pressing on, going up the stairs. It's always taking another stage of your life. It's always journeying. And he says, I press on toward the goal, upwards to God, stepping higher and higher to be in the presence of God. So when we look at life, we look at life with all its challenges. And every stage points you to the next step. And that we must look at life in such a way that God calls us not to look behind and regret and say, oh, this is terrible, all these terrible things that have happened. But to look ahead, to look forward, to take the steps of the staircase of life toward heaven instead of looking at our journey as a spiral downward situation of hopelessness. Jesus spoke about this in different ways. And one of, I think, the most uh, interesting ways in which Jesus has spoken is when he talked about the challenge that uh, he gave to his disciples and he says, you are to be the light of the world. And when he says you are to be the light of the world, he actually says that you must shine where you are. That in life, it is an opportunity to bear witness about Jesus Christ and to shine wherever you are. It is an upward climb of uh, shining for Christ and making sure that people see him and know him as Lord and Savior. You know, shining in the light of Jesus Christ is seen not only in terms of its physical understanding of bright light, but also of its spiritual understanding of being a light of enlightenment, a light of understanding about life and its possibilities through the objective of the words of Jesus Christ himself. In other words, the call, the upward call of each one of us is that we are not just to say, yes, I'm a Christian and that's it. Not, not just to say, yes, he asks us and wants us to be the light and that is it. But you notice that in the emphasis about this upward climb, it is always some motivation in each of our lives that we are to shine as lights, but that not we need to shine as lights as a natural light, but we must seek to go into the world of darkness so that that dark world may have the light. That means to say that we are called upon not only to shine as lights, but we are called upon to go to the dark places. In other words, we take the initiative. We must, we must take that step, that upward step of going to the darkness so that there may be light. It's not just standing up and say, I'm the light. That doesn't make any sense. It is to go to the darkness so that light may be there. Do you know that uh, the, the light shines brightest in the darkest parts of the world. In other words, you must go to the very dark places before light can be seen at its best. And so if you got uh, some kind of a light and you go out today out of this church and you go out to the sunlight, it doesn't make sense. The light doesn't shine that brightly because there's this bright sunlight outside. But you go to a dark corner you go to a place in the room where there's no light and you bring that light 
and the light will dispel the darkness. In other words, we are bearers of the light. We are to be bringers of the light. When God says you are to shine as light of the world, it is not just to shine, but it is to bring that light into the world of darkness. So, in this world, we glow best and uh, we shine best in the darkest corners of the world. There's a story that's told about in the olden days before the electricity was uh, around about a lamp lighter. And this is a very interesting story, very simple. The man is employed simply to be a lamp lighter. During those times, they had lamp posts, but on the top of each lamp post is just uh, a kerosene sort of a lighting system. And this man comes and he has a ladder. He carries the ladder and he puts the ladder on uh, the lamp post, climbs up the ladder, and he opens the small window of this lamp and uh, he lights it. Then he closes the small window of the lamp and he walks down, carries that uh, ladder with him and goes to the next lamppost. At the next lamppost, he puts the ladder, climbs up, lights it up, then comes down, takes his ladder and goes to the next lamppost. That is how they light up the streets at night. But the wonderful thing is that at dusk, when this man goes from one lamppost to the other, right down the street. When night falls, when night falls, and you look from a distance, the whole street is lit by the lamp lighter, so that you know that the lamp lighter has been there. He has lighted the street, and now the streets are bright because of the lamp lighter. If you look at your life and you look at our life, in the journey of our life, across the years, through the streets of time, that we are called to be light bearers as well. We are to be light and lamp lighters in the life of people. So that over the years, as they trace your journey, that you have been there and that you have caused the light of Jesus Christ to shine in somebody's life. And that throughout that journey, you as a lamp lighter, the one who brings the light, has made it possible for others to know about Jesus Christ. That's the first thing I want you to, to keep in mind that we are called upon not just to bear the light, but we are to bring the light to people. It takes effort. It takes energy. It takes determination. It takes initiative. It takes a challenge from God himself to say that we are all not only light bearers, but we should be light bringers, lamp lighters in the hearts and lives of people, that they may be enlightened, that they may know about who this Jesus is. And that's part and the work of evangelism. There's a second thing that is very important when we look at this passage of scripture, when it says, you are to be the light of the world. And the way I look at it, is that if we are going to light in the spiritual darkness of this world, then we are going to need another light source to shine in our life. In other words, the light is not our own. If we want to shine, we must shine with the light of Jesus Christ. The source of that light is not in us, 
but the source of that light has come into us from the light of the world himself. In other words, what it means is that we are the people who would reflect that light. We are the people who would give that light which has been given to us in our time through Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. Several years ago, my wife and I joined our, our first son uh, in uh, having a family vacation and uh, we all decided to go to Phuket for about four or five days together for a family vacation. It was a very nice place. We had a, a chalet all to ourselves. But I remember that uh, there was one uh, evening at about dusk time after the children had uh, the grandchildren had gone for a swim and all kind of things and grandma was uh, bathing one of the grandchildren I was uh, bathing one of the other grandchildren the third grandchild was being taken by of by my son and as I was soaping this boy uh, and I was uh, shampooing his hair suddenly there was a blackout in Phuket, I did not know that, uh, you know, it's, that it's a frequent thing like that. But suddenly there was a blackout. We were right in the midst of shampooing this fellow. And suddenly it was so dark, I couldn't even see him in front of me. And I was saying, finish, you know, this, finish. Or what, what are we going to do? He's going to scream, or he's going to shout, he's going to panic. But in fact, none of the children panicked. The adults panicked. We did not know what to do. And I would say, how, how do I finish bathing this boy in the darkness? I can't even see him right in front of me. And it was pitch dark. And, and so uh, we were saying, frantically asking, where, where, where can we get light? And my son remembered he brought the only one torchlight and uh, cannot find it. Uh, it was buried somewhere in his suitcase. And in the darkness, cannot even find where the suitcase was, let alone looking for the torchlight. Someone said, let's, let's find a match. But it was a, a strange house. We did not know where the matchsticks were. And then my daughter-in-law said, turn on your mobile phone. Isn't that a wonderful thing nowadays, that, to have a mobile phone? Not only to do SMS and making your phone calls. The mobile phone, when you turn on, is a light. And it brightens the place. And I say, yeah, good idea, but where's the mobile phone? <laughs> and in the darkness, you cannot find the mobile phone. But nowadays, there are mobile phones. I need to say, it's wonderful to have mobile phones nowadays. Uh, just about three months ago, I was uh, at, at, a, at one of the uh, train stations. And I saw this girl. She's about in her very early uh, 20s. Uh, no? And she took out her mobile phone. And I was saying, oh, she's going to text and she's going to send something. But no, she took out the mobile phone and uh, then I'm looking at her and said, what, what is she doing? And I just peeked, uh, peeked across, look at that. Oh, that's her image there. And she's actually using her mobile phone as a mirror. And she was uh, <laughs> and taking her, her lipstick and she was uh, using her mobile phone. Is that interesting? Anyway, a mobile phone Nowadays, not only is luminous, but a mobile phone nowadays has an application which is a torchlight application. So you can make out of your mobile phone a torchlight. So what is the moral of this story? Always have your, your mobile phone with you. <laughs> so when there is a blackout, you have the light. Now, when we look at it from a spiritual viewpoint, there is a source of light that we need. And that source of light is God himself in you. And so the moral of this story in its spiritual understanding is that you must always have God by your side. Or you must always have Jesus Christ dwelling in you. Because wherever Jesus Christ is, you have the light. The light shines, and uh, therefore you can, you can shine for Christ. The Bible says in Scripture, and this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 to verse 7, For it is the God who commanded light 
to shine out of darkness who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the light shines only if you have that light within you. And the only way in which you can have that light in you is to have God in you. To have God in your life. In fact, the enemies of Peter, James and John, the, the, the disciples who carried on the ministry of Jesus Christ, the enemies and those who were actually people who were uh, against the ministry of Peter, James and John in Acts chapter 4 at verse 13 actually said these words and this is very, very interesting supports what I'm trying to say and in Acts chapter 4 verse 13 they looked at Peter they looked at James and they looked at John and they saw all these miracles and all these wonderful things that have happened and it was a miraculous work of of uh, ministry in this new uh, life of the church that they said to themselves, these people are uneducated. How can they have this boldness to preach? How can they have the depth of understanding about life and the beauty of life and the wonderful things that are seen through the miracles? They concluded, says the Bible, these are the enemies, they concluded that Peter, James and John had been with Jesus all the time. They concluded that the disciples had been with Jesus. You see, the only way in which we can shine is to have another source. That source is the light of the world. That source is Jesus Christ. In other words, for each and every one of us, we need to practice the presence of God, the presence of Jesus Christ always there with you. And where Christ is there always with you, the light will shine. Then thirdly and finally, it's not only that God calls us to be the light of the world in our staircase journey of life in that we must go to the darkness. Yeah, that's the first thing. We must go to the darkness. The darkness is where sin is. The darkness is where danger is. The darkness is where there is opposition to our faith is. We must go to the darkness so we may shine. The second thing is that we cannot shine until we have the light of God in us so that when God is constantly present in us, wherever we go, the light of God is there. But the third thing that I want to leave with you finally is that for each and every one of us, an understanding of the shining of this light must be guided by the reason why the light should shine. And the scripture that was read gives us the answer. Let your light shine before all men that when they see your good works, they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. So shining has a purpose. And the purpose is that God may be seen and God may be known. Think about that, friends. A tremendous responsibility for you and for me. We are to shine. We are to shine in order that people seeing the light may see God. We are to shine so that people seeing the light may have an understanding of God. We are to shine so that people seeing the light may know this God. What a tremendous responsibility. Our light is to shine, not to glorify ourselves, but seeing through the work that we do, they see God. They see the love of God. They see the mercy of God. They see the kindness of God. They see what we do 
in the world and begin to see that God is real, that God is available, and that they too may know God. So to call upon our Christian brothers and sisters is to call upon each and every one of us to be a light bearer and a light sharer and a light that points to God so that people can see God and know God. Let your light shine so that people may glorify God and know God and really believe in this wonderful God. You know, in this world today, and I close with this illustration, in this world today, of all the terrible things that are happening in the Middle East and in many parts of uh, the regions in Syria and other places in Afghanistan and in Pakistan and in all the other stands, is a story that comes just quite recently of a group of YWAM volunteers. You know what YWAM is, eh? Youth with a Mission volunteers who gave themselves in ministry in Afghanistan. Think about that. Would you yourself go to Afghanistan today? Would you allow your son to go to Afghanistan today? Here's a group of volunteers, Christian volunteers, who went into Afghanistan to do ministry. And part of their ministry was to teach English. And the story goes on to say that they were holding night classes Monday through Thursday. Friday is, of course, their very special day. So uh, from Monday to Thursday, just four days per week, every night, from about 7 to about 10 o'clock, they will have students who will come and they will teach them English. But the story that becomes more interesting is that at the end of each session at night, some people, not all, some people stay back. And they stay back and they ask more questions about English grammar, ask questions about how do I translate this word or that. So they stay back to ask more questions about English. And then as they progress and talk about some of the questions, they ask, now why are you here, etc., etc. And that's where they share their faith about Jesus Christ. Why are you here? Because I'm a Christian and because I committed to help you and I'm here to teach you, and etc., etc., etc. There was a one woman, and the true story, friend, one woman was observing all these fellow students staying back each night asking questions. And from a distance, she started to listen to what the volunteers, the YWAN volunteers, were talking about. And she discovered to her horror that after they talked about English, they were talking about Jesus Christ. They were talking about their faith. They were sharing their faith. And this woman got so angry. She was so angry that she came up to the YWAM volunteers and she said, you, you, are, you are people who are actually misleading all of us. You come here under the guise of teaching us English, but you're actually talking about your Jesus Christ. So you know what she said? I curse you. I curse every one of you YWAM volunteers for doing this decepting, uh, decep deception. I curse you. And I curse you. And I curse you, she said. That night, she went to bed. And sometime during midnight, she was awoken by a brilliant light, she couldn't understand what it was. It was a tremendously powerful, brilliant, bright light. And this light kept shining on her, and uh, she was so spellbound by it that she did not know what to do. Then there was a, this inner voice that came to her. And the inner voice, seeing that light, she was saying she heard that it was like Jesus appearing to her in this brilliance of light and saying, why are you cursing 
my children, I love you, I have died for you. And she said, oh, this is a terrible thing. Huh? Uh, you know, I, I cursed these workers huh, earlier on. Now Jesus is coming to take revenge on me. And she actually was so frightened, she said she went down on her knees and she was seeing this image that was coming to her and the, it was coming closer and closer to her and this image was raising his hand and says, this is finished, this is my last moment and this Jesus is coming to kill me for what I've done in cursing his volunteers. And as this appearance came and came nearer, it was not only one hand but both hands coming up. And she felt both hands coming right towards her. And instead of striking her, both hands came and touched her shoulders. And she felt a sudden warmth, a warmth of love and devotion and kindness and forgiveness. And she knew, she knew that that was an appearance of the light of the world. Jesus Christ himself. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. Do you know what she is today? Today, she is a university professor in Afghanistan and a light bearer that whoever she is teaching in Afghanistan, in her class, she being the professor, tells these people about Jesus Christ and how Jesus appeared to her and the love of Jesus Christ who forgave her for the curses that she swore on his volunteers. So she is a light now and everywhere she goes, she brings that light so that people may know about Jesus Christ where in Afghanistan. The Bible says you are to be the light of the world so that others seeing you bearing that light and shining that light and illuminating the hearts and the lives and the minds of people <clears throat> may begin to see and glorify God who is in heaven. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, our Father, we are more than aware of your presence in our midst and you call us to be light bearers. But not only to bear light, but to bring light to someone else. You have claimed that you are the light of the world. And, oh God, it is from you that we find the source of light and that you give us the light so we may shine. I pray, Father, that you may bring us into the world of sin and darkness, that we will not fear this darkness, <clears throat> but we will enter this darkness because we have the source of light in us. And I pray, Father, that as we shine, <clears throat> people may see you and know you and accept you for their own very lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people say, Amen.